In the Middle Ages, people didn't understand about the physics of lightning. They thought thunderstorms were a manifestation of the wrath of God. So they rushed off to the church and rang the bells, hoping to appease God. Unfortunately, the church tower was the highest thing around and very often got struck by lightning. Hundreds of bell ringers were killed. But if instead you put your faith in science and technology, can you tame the awesome and deadly power of lightning? Could I survive a lightning strike? This week, I've brought the Science Shack to the National Grid's High Voltage Laboratory because these people really know about making big sparks. <laughs> Do you know that every year in this country, something like 50 people are struck by lightning? Which means that you have a better chance of being struck by lightning than of winning the lottery. Luckily, there are ways of protecting yourself, and so the Science Shack team, this is Sophia, Marty, Chris, Jem and Linda, are busy building devices for protection. Of course, they'll want to test them and then zap the Shack and me with millions of volts, and I think they're looking forward to it rather more than I am. OK, so what do we have to do? Well, first of all, make sure the area is clear of anyone. Uh, I can't see anyone. Anyone clear? <laughs> The trouble with lightning is that it doesn't strike to order. But here at the National Grid, they have plenty of electricity, and they're going to let me use their 2 million volt impulse generator to make lightning at the touch of a button. Attention! Uh, it does go off with a bit of bang, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yes. yes. 2 million volts tear apart the molecules of the air and make it conduct electricity for a tiny fraction of a second. But it's the current, the amount of electricity flowing, that does the damage. The current in these sparks is 10,000 amps, all headed for a small wooden shed. So this is a serious challenge for the team. Can they protect first the shack and then, more important, me, from a deadly strike. The plan is to use an idea from the very earliest days of electrical science in the 18th century. In 1752, the American statesman and scientist Benjamin Franklin did an incredibly dangerous experiment. He flew a kite into a thunderstorm to show that lightning is a form of electricity. Now, whatever you do, do not do that at home. A chap in St. Petersburg was killed repeating it. However, the following year, in 1753, Franklin did another really elegant experiment. He wondered whether lightning was attracted by points. And he said, let the experiment be tried. And he made himself an artificial thundercloud like this, and he charged it up. Now, I've got Sophia here winding away at this Wimshurst machine to charge it up. I guess Franklin would have had to rub it with a piece of silk cloth or something. So we've now got this charged up thundercloud, and underneath it, I've got a domed building, well, a model of a domed building. And if you look carefully, you'll see that lightning is striking this building. There are sparks going from the cloud to the building. Now, here is a point. Watch what happens when I slide it underneath the cloud. Even when I get it some distance away, it's, oh, three or four centimetres away, the sparking has stopped. Take it away. The sparking starts again. So lightning is striking, but if there's a point, even fairly close to the cloud, it doesn't strike. What's actually happening is that charge is spraying off this point and neutralising the charge in the cloud. You see, it's almost like magic. And so he proposed that lightning conductors should be positioned on all public buildings. And the first public building that was protected in England was St Paul's Cathedral. Benjamin Franklin recommended pointed lightning rods, which work because the charge is concentrated at the sharp end. Not everyone agreed, 
and it's still controversial. But I'm with Ben, so Marty is making a nice, sharp copper conductor for the shack. When you're making one of these huge two million volt sparks, how long does it take that, that flash? Well, the flash, the, the voltage rises in about a millionth of a second to its peak. Then it falls again in perhaps less than one millionth of a second. Wow. So the whole thing takes only about a millionth of a second. Only about a millionth but it second. registers all right on your retina, doesn't That's it? it? Yeah, because it's bright, bright. And again, similar to a lightning impulse, it changes the air from being an insulator to an instant conductor, and you get the big bang coming from this plasma that comes down. Right, so the big bang is merely that the air is exploding That's it, in, in, all, in, in all directions, directions because yeah. it's being heated to a that's right, yeah. huge temperature. And that's all happening in that millionth, in of, that a millionth of a second. Yeah. Lightning is caused by high voltage in the thundercloud, but how on earth do you get a high voltage in a cloud? Well, nobody's absolutely certain, but it seems that inside a thundercloud you've got an enormous updraft, a tremendous whistling wind going upwards, carrying with it tiny, tiny ice crystals. And meanwhile, there are other ice crystals falling down, bigger ones, falling down by gravity. So the ice crystals going up rub against the ones coming down, and the friction generates electricity. Let me try and show you roughly what I mean. This huge green pipe represents my cloud, and here I've got a powerful fan which is going to generate my updraft. Here are my ice crystals. I'm actually using polystyrene beads, and I'll put a handful of them in here to be blown up by this fan. OK, now I shove that into there like that and give it a good hard wallop in, and then... Right, we're all ready. Switch on the fan, please. Here it goes, you can see them rushing round and with luck generating some electricity. Now this, this bit of wire here is connected to Earth. So if I bring it within range, with luck, we'll get some sparks. Just watch this, bring it down. I'm only generating a little bit of lightning, you understand. Ah, look, sparks. I've got lightning. I reckon that's jumping about five millimetres. And that's 15,000 volts just from blowing some polystyrene beads through the tube or ice crystals through my baby cloud. To investigate further, I contacted Dr Clive Saunders of the physics department at UMIST in Manchester, who's making clouds in his deep freeze. Well, we're simulating thunderstorms here. We've been doing this for several years, and we found that thunderstorms become electrified when ice crystals rebound off a hailstone which we simulate in the, in the cloud chamber here. Um, we found that if you have a very high water content in the thunderstorm, then the hailstones charge positively. If you have a very low water content, the hailstones charge negatively. We have flown through thunderstorms. We've measured the charges on hailstones, for example, and ice crystals, and we know that they are simulated adequately by our experiments. And what we're trying to work out is a theory of how thunderstorms become electrified and eventually how this electrification can lead to lightning. And what happens in our experiments is that the, typically the hailstones become negatively charged, they fall to the bottom of the thunderstorm, the ice crystals bounce off the hailstones and get carried in the updraft, and therefore you have a positive region at the top of the thunderstorm and negative towards the bottom. And you can get lightning between these charge centres and between the charge centres to ground. <laughs> Towards the end of the 18th century, a chap called John Canton from Stroud in Gloucestershire designed a very elegant thunderstorm predictor. Here's how to make one. You need a couple of these bicycle bells and glue them into the end of old ballpoint pens. Then you stick those into a wooden base. You see I put the cap in there and this just screws in like that. Then you take a third ballpoint pen, here it is, and in one end you screw one of these screw eyes and in the other end, you stick a big drawing pin. OK, hold it in with some tape or some glue. Hang that up on a hook between the two bells, and that is your thunderstorm predictor. This one is earthed. The question is, does it work? This is a direct current generator, which is going to make 300,000 volts. And this charge is going to go up this rod and charge up my wonderful thundercloud here. And then, with luck, my Canton Bell thunderstorm predictor will realise there's a thundercloud overhead, and the bell will ring. Let's see if it works. 
take off this earthing stick, and then can you switch on the current, please? The ringer is alternately attracted to and repelled by the charged bell on the right, ringing like mad and warning you a thunderstorm is coming. Is it going in? Every week, we appeal for your help via the website, and it's still not too late to get involved. In fact, if you log on, you can see some shots of us behind the scenes actually making the programmes. This week, we asked for your help to see if you'd taken any pictures of lightning. And here we are. This is from Norman Cummings of Tyne and Weir. Fine shot, that. Thanks very much indeed. This one here is from Stephen Denbury who's come from South Wales, he spent four hours, took 50 digital pictures, but it was worth it for this, this fine picture. Now, the next one is from Mark Parsons. Very dramatic shot, that, on a moonlit night in the Dordogne in France. Next picture. <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't fancy having been in one of those buildings. This is James Stapley. He took it in Johannesburg in South Africa, uh, wow, that's really scary, isn't it? I, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't there. This one is from Ian Law. He saw a thunderstorm approaching, and he set up his camera, and then the lightning struck much, much closer to him than he expected. It must almost have toasted his toes. Really quite a scary sight, that. And finally, this is my throat. Just look at this picture. That's wonderful. That's from Fred Miller, taken in Hackney multiple strokes, and also, look here, strokes actually between the clouds. That's really terrific. I've tried to take pictures of lightning, and it's extremely difficult. I once got one in India, but that was about 40 years ago. Anyway, if you're interested, do please look at the website. Not only does it tell you how to do it, well, there are tips anyway, but there are safety instructions, and please read those. Don't mess with lightning. It's very, very dangerous stuff. Finally, testing. Give a good contact there. OK? So as long as it beeps, we're OK. We've got contact all the way down to Earth. One, two, three. That's insulated. One, two, three. It beeps. The lightning conductor has to carry two million volts at perhaps 10,000 amps for a millionth of a second. It's vital to check the electrical conductivity from the tip all the way down to the ground. And in case you doubt the danger the shack is in, take a look at this. This was the cricket pavilion that belonged to the predecessor of the National Grid Lab in the 1960s, reduced to a burned-out shell by a direct lightning strike. Can we avoid this fate for the shack? OK, we're going to hit that shack with almost two million volts. See if our lightning conductor can take it. Voltage is creeping up. Just watch this yellow light here. Attention! Now, just watch this. Wow, that is amazing in this confined space. Anyway, the shack is still standing. It hasn't caught fire or blown up or anything. It looks like our lightning conductor is good. We'll give it one more try. Lightning tries to find the most direct route to the ground, so it tends to strike the tallest and best conducting thing it can find, in this case, our lightning conductor. But if you look at the bottom of the conductor, where we had a sharp bend, the charge escapes to take a direct route to Earth. Wow, well, the shack has stood several two million volt strikes. It hasn't exploded, hasn't caught fire. Clearly, our lightning conductor is working. OK, we've protected the shack, but how would you protect a person? The challenge for the team now is to make a special chamber that I can actually go inside while being zapped by a million-volt spark. Before submitting myself to what will genuinely be a life-threatening experiment, I wanted to understand a bit more about the destructive power of lightning. Oh, lovely. I persuaded Dr. Peter Housen of Brighton University to show me what happens when lightning strikes a tree. Here we go. Wow. Yeah, we're 
let you... So that's a million volts? That is a million volts. Okay. Can we zap it again? Right, here we give it another one. No. Now, it's splitting down the side of the bark. Why is that? Well, the current is finding the most conductive path, which is between the bark and the inner core of the tree. Right, so as it tracks down, it heats up the um, sap within its path which forms a, a hot explosive wave or high pressure because it's so quick you know. sap. that's right yes right and so the sap simply bursts out through the side it just simply bursts out through the side and, uh, doesn't do the tree any good at all oh no of all the people who get struck by lightning about half are indoors but it's very very rare for anyone to die by being struck by lightning while indoors However, if you are indoors during a thunderstorm, do not get on the phone, because that's the most dangerous thing you can do. Just watch this. When the phone's hit, it appears undamaged, though the electronic components have probably suffered. But if we see it again, this time stopping on the strike, you can see how the spark hits the body of the phone, but instantly travels along the cable to the handset, the bit you'd be holding. Phone wires are vulnerable because they're out in the open, but any electrical circuit could be affected. We invited along a very brave woman called Kim Bradburn, who has actually survived a lightning strike to her house. So I sw went to switch the light on, and the second I switched the light on, the lightning struck the roof. Obviously, it was going to ground. You mean as, as you went to switch as the I light on? Yeah, it hit the conservatory roof. Right. And obviously, I interrupted it, going to ground. So it was going through the light circuit? Yeah, and it blasted out of my hand. So what actually... OK, what happened at the moment, you went up to switch on the light... And there was just an absolute, a terrific bang. Yes. And a flash. So what had actually happened to your hand? Well, actually, it, um, it blasted all the flesh from my hand here, broke my, a joint at the base of my thumb, my thumb was back here, and all this flesh, there was just a hole. Gosh. Was it blackened? No, it wasn't blackened, no, but you could smell, I know it sounds terrible, but you could smell like cooking, yeah. cooking meat, yes. and apparently that was all stuck to the patio door. But it, it's all right now? Well, it's, it's much better than it was. It's a bit red at the moment. Right. But, but it works, does it? I mean, oh, can... it works oh, very well. Yeah. Nice light, great. <laughs> and all your fingers work properly? Yes, fine. Now, are you scared about lightning? Yes. What do you do about it? Well, I've had a lightning conductor fitted to the house. We've also had a surge arrestor because I've been told that lightning can come back up as well as strike down. So I feel a bit safer about that. If I may say so, you don't actually seem to be frightened of it now. I'm not frightened of it. I think I respect it now. Respect the fact that what it can do. Well, obviously you've recovered from this. I yes. Mean, you're very cheerful about it, aren't well, you? Well, you've got to get on with it, haven't you? Perhaps it's you, it's you people from the West Midlands. Oh, yes. We've this, got a very good attitude. Yeah. But if I think what I ought to do is shake hands and say thank you very much for coming. That's quite all right. I think that's absolutely pr and, and fascinating too. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want Kim's story to frighten you. Very few people have an experience like that. But it does make you respect the power of lightning. So the team are being extra careful on this build because a life depends on it. Mine. However, I have confidence in the science of what they're doing because it was worked out by one of the great heroes of electricity, Michael Faraday. In 1836, he was doing some experiments with very sensitive equipment and he was afraid it might get damaged by some of the high voltage static electricity that was around the lab. And so he devised a very cunning thing, the Faraday cage to protect it. Let me show you. Here is a model of Michael Faraday holding a pair of polystyrene balls. And I can charge him up just by squeezing this thing here. And if you watch, you see these two balls he's holding in his hands. Watch what happens. You can see the balls swing apart. As they get charged, they repel one another because they've got the same charge, and they fly apart. But now, just see what happens when I put him inside the cage. I'll take him off carefully. I'll open the cage, and the cage is just made of copper wire. So it's a conductor, the whole thing. But what Faraday reckoned was that there would be no charge inside the charged conductor. So even though I'm now going to apply the same charge to the cage, nothing should happen to those polystyrene balls. Just watch.
You see, I'm putting the same charge on, and they stay exactly the same distance apart. They don't kick. So he was absolutely right. There is no charge inside the charged conductor. Now, Michael Faraday's original cage was four meters square, bigger even than the shack. But I've asked the Science Shack team to build one for me, just big enough for me to go in. And we want to find out whether it will protect me from a million volt strike. A slight hitch. The Faraday cage is finished, but unfortunately, no one measured the door it has to go through. Meanwhile, another scientist is queuing up to torture me with electricity. An amazing Croatian chap called Nikola Tesla invented these things, fluorescent tubes. He also invented a rather unusual way of lighting them up. Uh, Meg, what are you planning to do? I'm going to put this spoon into your mouth, yes. and then using this small Tesla coil, I'm going to apply about 30,000 volts to the end of it. Into my mouth? Yes. Am I going to die? Hopefully not. Oh, I hope not, too. In fact, Tesla used to light his New York laboratory with fluorescent tubes powered by one of his coils. Amazingly, they needed no wires. You just put a tube where you wanted light, and it got its power through the air. That was amazing. I was all lit up. And I'm not plugged into anything except me. But 30,000 volts is far too wimpy to hit me with, so Meg's colleague Ken has brought along his portable million volt Tesla coil. So, Ken, it's all set up. It's How all does set it up. actually work? OK, well, what happens is at the base here, we start with about 10,000 volts of very, very high frequency electricity. OK. It travels back and forth about 200,000 times a second. Wow. Now, that induces a million volts at the same frequency across that purple coil. And so we get this beautiful display of high voltage electricity from the top terminal. OK, let's see what it does. OK. That is quite startling. It's amazing. Um, why isn't it sparking to Earth? Well, it's just at a safe height, so that it can't actually reach Earth. The sparks are travelling about a metre and a half, and it's about two metres tall. Right, but where are they headed for? Well, they're heading into the atmosphere. I mean, that's the curious thing about this. Although there's no route to ground, no, no obvious route to ground, the electricity just finds a way into the atmosphere to disperse. Uh, why isn't it going to come and zap us? We're too far away. Sort of forked paths are fascinating, aren't they? Yeah, they wind as they find roots of moisture in the air. But why, once it's formed a path, why doesn't it go along it again? Because you've got ionised gas there. Because the moisture's changing all the time, the air dries out, it moves around, and so it just winds to find the path of least resistance all the time. Tesla had a dream of cordless electricity. Each building, or even town, would have its own huge Tesla coil with receivers to get the electricity into your appliances without wires. Although he did go on to pioneer the main system we use today, the Tesla coil has never really found a practical use. Unfortunately, Ken and the Science Shack team seem to have discovered one. The plan is that I should get into this wire cage and then, Ken, you're going to whop it with a million volts, yes? That's right, yeah. Uh, and you're sure it's safe? It's safe. I mean, th this is the principle that protects people in an aircraft when it's struck by lightning, for example. So it's, uh, it's been tested a thousand times for us. Right. So this is what Faraday said, there is no current inside a charged conductor, yes? That's right, yeah. OK, how are you going to make sure that the zapping goes this way? OK, well, we've got an electrode here which will direct the sparks over towards the cage. Ah, oh, thanks. OK, well, I guess I'd better get in, hadn't I? You better get in. <laughs> And we need to make sure that the door is well shut so that it's a completely closed shell. So I'm completely surrounded. Wire underfoot, wire overhead. Yep. Okay. okay, do your worst. All right, you ready? Yes. <laughs> that is very odd. It's very disconcerting when it comes absolutely straight for your eyeballs. <laughs> I want to see what that looks like if I point a camera at it. So. I'll stand back here and point that straight at the... Go on then, shoot. OK. Well, 
that's quite something. Is it safe to touch the wire? Um, you can come close to it. I wouldn't touch it in case your finger begins to poke through the mesh. I see. I think I'll just keep away if that's all right. <laughs> You do have to have it earth. Amazingly, the inside of the cage has no charge, but the metal on the outside is at a million volts. And we, we can demonstrate that by placing a couple of fluorescent lights just up against the side of the cage. And you say that the one inside won't light up? The one inside won't light up. The ones up against the cage should certainly light up. OK, well, I'm going to keep filming and I'll watch the tubes. OK. OK. Ready? Shoot. Fantastic. Well, I have to say that while we've made this program, I have learnt that electricity can have awesome power. But I've also learnt that you can do something to protect yourself against lightning. If you are caught in a real thunderstorm, you are more at risk standing out in the open where the lightning might strike you if you are the highest thing around. But lying down on the ground is also dangerous. As current leaks away from a strike, a high voltage could build up between your head and your feet. It's not a good idea to stand with your legs apart because current could go up one leg and down the other. Very unpleasant. Out in the open, the best thing is to crouch down close to the ground on the balls of your feet and your head tucked down. Don't use an umbrella or golf clubs. Sheltering under a tree is dangerous because of side strikes. Lightning can jump from the tree to a person. Also, the tree might explode. Most experts think that the best place to shelter is inside a car with the windows wound up. It's a Faraday cage. You're usually safer inside the house than outside. But don't use the phone and stay away from electrical appliances. OK, so I have to climb in here, yes? Yes. One last death-defying feat. How do you fancy being hoisted 50 feet into the air and then grabbing hold of a terminal at half a million volts. No, I don't fancy it either. And for protection, all I've got is my grey jumpsuit. I'm not sure about the style, but I do like the fabric. It feels like cotton, but it is in fact stainless steel. Not a Faraday cage, but my personal Faraday suit, as used by chaps who have to service those high-tension lines for the national grid. Another foot up. That's good, good. Now I'm 50 feet up and there's 400,000 volts here. It's quite scary. I can't feel anything yet. Tingling, I can hear crackling. Ah! Wow, look at that. And if I catch it, I can't feel anything. So the answer to the question is, yes, you can survive a lightning strike, but it's far better to give lightning the respect it deserves and avoid the danger in the first place. If you have a science question you'd like answered, a team of experts from the Open University is standing by. All you have to do is visit the Science Chat website at www.bbc.co.uk slash science slash science chat.